Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. That surprised you, didn't I? We're going to be looking at two Old Testament books tonight. We're going to look at Ruth and Esther. But I want you to mark your Bible in Ephesians because I'm going to keep referring back to it. And then once you've got that marked, then turn to Ruth and uh, we'll follow along together. It is wonderful to have heroes in this life. Now, we all know that no human being can possibly meet the, the standard of perfection. Anybody that you pick to be your hero at some point is going to let you down. But it's good to have people in your life who build you up and people who serve as examples. And it's also helpful to have people that in some ways remind you of the kind of people you want to become. And that's why I'm really grateful that the Bible has heroes of all kinds. I want to talk a little bit about how God in his providence wanted to make sure that there were some women heroes, especially for our young girls who are trying to figure out what it means and what it looks like to be a woman of God. And I think it's also very helpful for all of us men to remind us of how much we're called to respect and appreciate women of God. In, a, in the book of Ruth, <clears throat> we have a story centering on a faithful woman at a time when all hope seemed to be lost, faithful to her calling to serve her family, faithful to her sense of belonging to a group, faithful to the mission of providing and caring for those who have been taking care of her. In the story of Esther, we have a story centering on a faithful woman at a time when all hope seemed lost, faithful to her heritage, faithful to her older cousin who helped raise her, and faithful to the calling of God. What's interesting is that these are two books that the more you read them, the more questions come up. Esther, for example, is 10 chapters that never mentions the name of God once. And it made it into our Bibles. Ruth is not, and Naomi are not people who are in the line, in the heritage you would expect them to be in, to be the heroes of the story. And yet through them comes the Messiah. It's amazing what God does with these stories. God comes to the rescue by providing more than could possibly be imagined. And that is Ephesians. Ephesians 3, the end of the chapter, he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. We need to be reminded that God doesn't always check in with us to see if we're okay with what he's about to do. He doesn't always play by the rules that we think he's supposed to play by. And when he does that, he breaks open our categories and reminds us he is God and I am not. And that I need to see with his eyes rather than constantly making God in my own image. And so the story of Ruth starts by breaking open some of those categories that we would have thought were just so obviously true. God's got his special people. He's only going to work for those special people. And that's where you get your hero stories. Not true, says the book of Ruth. Naomi is an Israelite woman who has experienced the terrible loss of her husband and sons, leaving her with no means of support. And in her words, she went away full, but has returned empty. Look in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 21. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. So why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? She feels lost. She's lost her husband. She's lost her sons. She had left her homeland and feels alone. But she finds redeeming love 
in what may seem like an unlikely source. Not her blood kin, but her daughter-in-law, who comes from the area of Moab. Ruth is not an Israelite, but she pledges her faithfulness to Naomi. And she has that beautiful line, a line that my parents used in their wedding ceremony. Where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. We also have the interesting addition of a man named Boaz. Boaz is a relative. And the interesting thing about being a relative here is if you're connected with the book of Leviticus, he isn't just a relative. He's that special relative given a special role. In the King James, it's the kinsman redeemer. And what that means is it's his job when he finds somebody in the extended family in need of help. The responsibility falls on him to care for them. So God provides a way where this woman who feels so lost finds the pledge of love from her daughter-in-law. And then the two of them find even greater relief by being brought into line with the actual kinsman redeemer who has a responsibility to care for the extended family. God providentially provided Naomi with a relative who stands by her, and God provided Ruth with a relative who shall redeem them both. Naomi and Ruth not only enjoy food and security, they enjoy abundance. Now, this is one of those stories that reminds us of the gospel narratives with Jesus. Think about his feeding the 5,000. It would be enough. It would be an amazing story if God took someone who felt empty and gave her some food. But God takes a woman who feels empty and lost, along with her daughter-in-law, who now feel all alone by themselves, and gives them more than they could possibly imagine. And then on top of that, the Messiah. The Messiah will come through her line, and she will be one of the five women listed in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, through whom comes Jesus Christ. Naomi was living a hopeless, empty life, not unlike all of us, when we were, in the words of Ephesians 2 and verse 12, without hope and without God in the world. But God provides a couple of things, and all three of them remind us of Jesus Christ. God provides a friend whose love knows no end in Ruth. And don't we find that in Jesus? God provides a redeemer who will give fullness of this life in abundance. And remember John 10:10, 10, 10, Christ says, I came to give them life and to give it to them abundantly. And number three, God provides an heir through whom will come the Messiah who provides fullness of life for all. You remember that through that line is King David and through that line is Jesus Christ. Look in Ephesians 3 and let's look at verses 16 through 19. According to the riches of his glory, may he grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You wonder what they were thinking when first there's some gleanings that are available. And then what are they thinking when Boaz calls Ruth closer in? And what are they thinking when Boaz takes her as his wife and offers them abundance? What were they thinking as she has a child and wonders, could God use even this for his glory? What were the great grandchildren thinking when they told the story of Ruth? And they say, tell us, tell us about David. And tell us where this story leads. 
It's a great quote here from one of the books I was using to put this together. God became flesh in Jesus Christ in order to become our guardian redeemer and to fill our emptiness with the fullness of life. We no longer have to be satisfied with scraps and an uncertain future. We eat the bread of life now, and we know our future is secure with God. The story of Ruth tells us the gospel. And of course, we also have the story of Esther. <laughs> Esther takes place at a time when God's people were under Persian rule. This isn't just that they're under a dominating force. You got to remember at a time when the land is sacred, the people are sacred, the story is supposed to be central, sacred, and set apart. Being under Persian rule makes everything complicated. Esther enters the scene at a time when the people are feeling lost. Her father and her mother are dead. She's raised by an older cousin, Mordecai, and responding to his advice, Esther keeps her Jewish identity a secret as she's called to the king's harem. It's got to be a scary time. There's all kinds of interesting questions that commentators are dealing with at this point. What, how many options do you have at that time period when the king calls you to his chamber? What happens if you say no? What do you allow yourself to do or not do? What does it mean to be faithful to your story, but also to be open to letting God tell his story? It's not an easy situation to be in. Esther keeps her Jewish identity a secret as she's called into the harem. But God's at work, elevating Esther above all the others to become queen and through her to conquer the enemy and to redeem Israel. The main enemy in the story is a man named Haman, who makes a case against Mordecai and the Jews by describing them in Esther chapter 3 and verse 1 as a people who keep themselves separate. That's his negative language for these people. Now, you're going to see this storyline happen over and over again. It's kind of very similar to what you get in the book of Daniel when they're trying to explain to the king why the king should have trouble with, say, Daniel or with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and what is it? They're not like everybody else. They're separate. They do their own thing, and that's not going to be good for our kingdom because that means they might end up serving a different leader. But it's this separateness that reminds, that reminds the reader that Israel was promised covenant protection by God. And we see his providence at work all through history. And it ends with God's people being rescued and elevated. Esther is an unlikely hero. But so is the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth. You know, looking at the story as it begins, you wonder to yourself, how could this possibly be the way the story is going to unfold? Esther shows up. How is she going to compete with all these others? If she does compete with all these others, how is the story going to be any different than maybe she just falls into whatever story uh, the king wants her to live? And if she tries to stand up to the king, surely this will end very unwell for her. And if it doesn't end unwell for her, the most you could expect is he might be sympathetic at most. But the story is one of overabundance to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. In fact, if you remember the language, Mordecai says to Esther, who's nervous and scared and unsure, who knows, but maybe you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. I can't help but see similar language in Galatians chapter 4, when Paul, talking about the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth that on the front end of the story would have looked like this can't be God at work. We've got this probably teenage woman who's pregnant in a city that doesn't seem to be that great. 
in an outskirt area and is about to give birth to a kid who's not going to ever travel more than 50 miles from his hometown. But you know the story that happens with Jesus. And in Galatians 4, Paul says, in just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. You might just say, for such a time as this. I don't really know all the reasons why God chose that moment to be the middle of history in which he sends Christ, but I can't help but look back and at least see some of the blessings of that moment. The Roman Empire thought that it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Or maybe sliced bread was the greatest thing since the Roman Empire. I don't remember which one came first, but that's the way they thought about themselves. But it's pretty amazing. The Greeks before them were great fighters, but every time they'd go to fight, they'd get their chariot stuck in the mud. But the Romans came along and they were the first to have all terrain vehicles and all weather roads. And there was, a, there was actually a saying, all roads lead to Rome. You also had them sort of uniting an empire behind them. And if you were looking at it from the outside, you'd say, this is bad. The wrong people are controlling God's territory and they've been trolling all the roads. But who would have guessed that because of that, it allowed the gospel to travel fast and swift in every direction. So much so that 300 years later, Rome announces we are now Christian. It's pretty incredible how, in fact, you have the story being told at a time when you wouldn't have expected. And you'd say, this doesn't seem right. And God says, no, it's more than right. The book of Esther ends with a feast day declared to remember God's deliverance. And we also enjoy a feast of remembrance for our deliverance every Sunday. We gather together and we take the bread, we take the fruit of the vine, and we remember that we are now rescued. Our bodies may wear out and die, but as long as we're part of Christ's body, there is no end to our story. Our story continues because of Christ. I want you to notice something about action also in these stories. An example of, about action tying into the gospel is in Esther chapter 8 and verse 10. Mordecai believes that God's going to be at work. And he knows that the story that God's doing is going to be great. But he has to notify the people. And in Esther 8 and verse 10, he goes to great lengths to notify the people, the fastest horses in all the directions. And in the New Testament, Paul plays on that kind of theme in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, where he says, you all know that we're not just saved. We are Christ's ambassadors. And because we're his ambassadors, we plead his case. And an ambassador quite literally means someone who goes in the place of their master. We go to the four winds on the fastest horses to carry the message out. There are people in this congregation who've been doing that their entire lives. Talk to the people involved in World Bible School. Talk to Steve Choate about his family and the work that they've done. Talk to all the missionaries we support. And what I see again is God is doing his story and God is doing his work. Will we be involved in getting the message out? A couple of questions for us to think about as we uh, kind of wrap up these two stories. But I want you to think about these throughout the week. Are the things that we are relying on for fulfillment only leaving us empty instead? I, I see in the story of Naomi, somebody who went chasing after some sort of happiness only to feel empty in the end. Sometimes it can be good things that we're going after. But when we feel empty, we know where to turn. Do we really believe that our deepest needs, our deepest desires, can only be answered by the one who made us? And isn't it time 
that we choose fullness over emptiness. Another question. Are you getting all the fullness of life that Christ promises? You can know the contentment that God wants for you, no matter what your circumstances are, if you can bask in the story. The more you understand the story, the more it grows in your heart, the more likely we are to be able to hang on to him in the most difficult times. Remember that line at the end of Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, where he says, or the beginning of chapter 12, he says, I want you to remember your creator while you're young. It doesn't mean that you should forget about your creator when you're old. He's saying so many people go through difficulties and the difficulties become the story and they forget. They forget the joy and the zeal they had when they first committed their lives to Christ. We have the same kind of language later in the New Testament where it says there are going to be people even late in the last days, if not already now, saying, where's the promise of his coming? And the language is that you kind of forget. You forget. And what I find here is that God is trying to remind us in Ruth and in Esther, don't forget, God comes to the rescue. I do think it's amazing. It's powerful. It's, it's you know, superpower level, exciting stories, Ruth and Esther. But if we've been reading from Genesis on, looking for the gospel, we shouldn't be surprised. God comes to the rescue. And he comes when you need it most. And he comes in unlikely ways. And he chooses unlikely heroes. When David, the shepherd boy, is chosen to be the king, and of course he's chosen among all the brothers, and all the brothers look the part more than the David, the shepherd boy does. I wonder if somebody said, boy, this story reminds me of your great, 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 great grandma. And you wonder if a little bit later, when other stories were being told about unlikely heroes in the Bible, somebody said, yeah, let me tell you about Esther. And let me tell you what God does in situations you never would have imagined. I want to say this very clearly. Whatever situation you're in right now, that is a situation in which God can tell his beautiful story of redemption and salvation. Whatever your lot, God can and will tell his story through your situation. It is okay to pray for God to remove your struggles. It's godly to pray that. David prays that in the Psalms. Paul prays it three times about the thorn in his side. But it's also godly to say, if this be your will, if this cup is not going to pass from me, if this thorn's going to stay in my side, if this is the story you're writing for my life, let this be a story that brings you glory. And watch what God does with it in ways you couldn't possibly ask or imagine. How can God be an agent? How can you be an agent of God's deliverance in the place where he's put you? What are some ways that you could make the good news known to those who are lost? And how far are you willing to go to be used by God to bring about his deliverance by first of all having confidence that God is at work in your story and then encouraging you to be involved and other people's stories. I find these two books powerful and meaning, meaningful and moving, and I hope that you do too.